So what I wanted to say is that conjunction are very, very crucial in astrology because, again, the most famous conjunction is the new moon that happens every 28, 29 days. Uh, we have also your birthday, which is a very important conjunction, conjunction of the sun and the sun. It's called solar return. We're going to also talk about it in the class on March 20th. So the concept of conjunction is that there are considered to be the most powerful alignment because it's literally a feeling that two planets energies are coming together to create a gestalt of something new that's much bigger than the two of them alone not only that represents a mingling of the colors of the frequencies of the two planets or the two heavenly bodies it also represents a new cycle because conjunction always represents a beginning of a cycle because what's happening the two planets are coming together one of them is going to go faster obviously one of them is passing it and as it passes it it's going to create a square and then an opposition and then uh, other formations so basically what is starting is a cycle of the two planets coming together so uh, that's why anytime two planets are coming together a new a new story is starting to be told you can say that a new narrative there is a twist in the tale the plot thickens uh, there is some kind of moment when you go like wait 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 what just happened you know it's not like you can uh, watch it and start looking at your phone or doing other things this is a time where things are happening you know there is a there is a meeting between the sheriff and uh, the, the antagonist you know that's something that you have to put your phone down to uh, stop talking to whoever you're talking to and pay attention to the story so that's a conjunction a conjunction is definitely a situation where the story is propelled forward or there is a, even an introduction of a new character. And what's happening this week, uh, what we have is an interesting formation because around Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, we're going to have a triple conjunction, what is called a stellium or a, a cluster. You have Mercury, the Sun, and Saturn coming all together. Mercury and the Sun comes to come together uh, frequently because Mercury is kind of a fast planet, so it goes around pretty fast. Uh, Saturn, on the other hand, is a different story because Saturn and the Sun conjunct only once a year. That's when the Sun passes through uh, over Saturn. So what we're going to have is Mercury chasing after the Sun, passing the Sun, while the Sun, which is slower than Saturn, going after Saturn, passing Saturn, and moving forward. So it's literally a rally race when um, uh, Mercury is passing the baton to Mars, to the Sun, and then the Sun passing it to Saturn, and then uh, they're going to all pass it, instead of uh, except Saturn, into Neptune, which is going to happen uh, towards uh, uh, the uh, middle of March, let's say. So we're definitely having this week a very Piscean week. It's a week that has a lot of influence in Pisces. We have Mercury, the messenger in Pisces. He doesn't like to be in Pisces. He's considered to be fallen in Pisces. Fallen, remember we talked about it, a planet is considered to be fallen when it is opposite to the place where it's going to be exalted it kind of makes sense uh, in um, uh, the concept of exaltedness is to exalt somebody to bring somebody up there and fallen is to bring down so obviously the opposite of exaltation is fallen so that's why when mercury is exalted in virgo getting the most respect in virgo then it will feel fallen in pisces and that also makes sense. I always give the example of Mercury in Pisces. The phone has fallen into the toilet and is now uh, deemed um, unusable. At least we cannot communicate through it. It smells kind of weird and you're really pissed because uh, that's it. The, the communication is done. The same way that when you talk under the water, it doesn't sound very coercive. You can't really uh, talk about the th any kind of theory or philosophy underground underwater sorry so that's the mercury in pisces on the other hand remember there is a law in life and there is a law in astrology that describes life that whatever is a blessing is a curse and whatever is a curse is actually a blessing so your talents are also the things that make you dull in other situations or you can say that whatever is your imperfection is really what makes you perfect and what you're perfect it is really your imperfection it can lead into ego problems so same thing with mercury in pisces in one sense it is very difficult to communicate because it's hard to communicate underwater but maybe the communication changes you shut up and you start transmitting things telepathically or psychically or you become more of a medium 
that's what Mercury in Pisces is. So if you have Mercury in Pisces in your chart, don't be upset. It's all good because you can do automatic writing. Maybe you're communicating dreams very well. You can communicate through movement uh, very well. And you are very intuitive, psychic. Maybe you have even precognition and the ability to see things before they actually happen. So Mercury in Pisces, at least for the next few weeks, is going to give us much more psychic energy, way more intuition, more synchronicities, more coincidences, more uh, learning from your dreams, more encounters with really mystical being or mystical animals. And that's part of that Mercury in Pisces. So it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's a great thing for certain things. So again, any kind of healing, remote healing, faith healing, anything that has to do with your meditations, all of those things could work much, much better in the next few weeks. But if you're planning to do something very logical, you might need to focus a little bit more because the Pisces is going to be like Alice in Wonderland. She's not giving you a straight answer. The sun is going to be for the next three weeks also in Pisces because that's the time of the year, the season of Pisces. And Saturn, since March of last year until February of 2026, is visiting Pisces. He does that every 30 years, 93, 94, 95, 64, 65, 66, were the last times that Mercury was in Pisces. So that's part of the cycles we're going to talk about in uh, on March 20th. And Neptune, since 2012, for another year or so, is going to be in Pisces. So it just happens to be that Neptune is really rarely in Pisces. The last time he was in Pisces in the middle of the 19th century was when he was actually discovered. <clears throat> so Neptune was discovered when he was in Pisces, which is interesting because Neptune is the ruler of Pisces. Saturn there every 30 years, the sun there once every year, Mercury is there um, every nine months or so. So we have all of those planets conjuncting together this week in Pisces. And that's kind of a um, cluster of Pisces, an influence of Pisces. When you have 40% of the chart in this week in one sign, it's kind of a big deal. It doesn't happen that often. And it basically means that there is a great deal of emphasis on that archetype. And remember the rule we always said, if there is a lot of emphasis on, pi on a certain sign, automatically the opposite sign is holding space for it and it's involved in the drama. The same way that if I am shooting a movie, I have the camera, but the camera is focused on whatever is happening in the scene. So maybe the scene is a Piscean scene, but the camera will be a Virgo. You know, it's shooting the Pisces. It's not part of the scene, but it's making sure that the scene is captured, <clears throat> is delivered, is understood. And we have Pisces, which is acting out now. Maybe it's a, a, a dance show. Actually, I, sh I saw this really good dance show, by the way, Message in a Bottle, that's based on the songs of Sting and Police. It's a, it's a dance performance with a story. Really brilliant. I, I think it's touring, so if you can catch it, totally worth it. But anyway, what's happening is that what Virgo is shooting is a dance show because that's what Pisces is all about. Maybe it's an animation. Uh, maybe it is something that has to do with the fantasy story. But that's what Pisces is. It's now monitoring. That's Vir Virgo is monitoring the Piscean energy that we have and hold space for it, especially today and tomorrow when we still have even the moon in in Virgo, because we had just now the full moon, the full moon is always an opposition of the sun and the moon. If there's a lot of energies in Pisces, the opposite sign, Virgo, of course, the moon is still in Virgo. Today, it happens to be that the moon is on top of the black moon. That's not always comfortable, especially with mother figures or women around you. There's some negativity coming up of jealousy, projections of negativities, um, a feeling that uh, of insecurities, a feeling of being completely misunderstood. So don't take things personally. If people are criticizing you today or being snappy or um, being over analytical and trying to be your psychoanalysis, even though uh, you just wanted to hang out with them. So again, be aware that today specifically 50% of the chart is in the axis of Virgo and Pisces, which again is quite a lot because we have 12 signs. We expect to have 15%, 12% in each sign. When you have 40% in Pisces, it just means that this week is very Piscean. So anything to do with imagination, anything to do with um, mysticism, movement, yoga, dance, those things can help you channel it and try as much as you can to have siestas. Even Einstein, who was a Pisces, recommended siestas. I'm not talking about hours on end of siestas. I'm talking about maybe 20 minutes of siestas. Those things can really help channel that energy. And of course, anything to do with yoga, shivasanas, meditations, 
imagination, working with imagination could be very, very positive, especially because in the next few weeks, most of the messages are not going to come through your mail or through your emails, but through your uh, T-mails, telepathic uh, mails or messages that can come in different ways through synchronicities, through coincidences, through your, again, imagination. But creative visualization can be very, very powerful uh, for you in the next few weeks. So Mercury today is three degrees Pisces. Uh, again, very strong connection to imagination. And the sun is coming closer and closer to Saturn, which is going to be peaking around Wednesday and Thursday. And that means that Wednesday and Thursday are a little bit more heavy than regular days. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be bad heaviness. Uh, heaviness could be also good. You know, it's cold and you go to your uh, to sleep at bed and you put your blanket on and it feels heavy. It feels good. So it doesn't always have to be bad. It just means that there is a feeling that there needs to be more connection to discipline, uh, more of a need for a plan. It's a good time to actually create the plan for the rest of the year. So if you can sit down and trace precisely what you want to achieve when, that would be a great time to do it this week. Even though we're in Pisces, which is awfully confusing, Saturn on top of the sun helps you create some crystallization of your plans. So that's going to be Tuesday and Wednesday. But because Saturn is such a slow planet and such a strong planet, I would recommend already starting thinking about what is it you want from the next year now. And because we have on March 20th the big time, a great time to actually push forward with a new New Year resolution because it's the astrological New Year, that will be also a great thing to do. So again, that's going to be happening this week. But what we have today, Sunday, is the residue of the full moon that was happening between Friday and Saturday. A feeling of being pushed and pulled between a lot of yes and no, a, some kind of purge, purification, purge. And remember, we talked about it this weekend that is a, ruled by this full moon energy does represent an end of the year because it's the last full moon of the astrological year and that represents an end of all ends especially because Pisces is the last sign and Virgo is the sign that likes to cut okay and cut you know that's precisely what uh, Virgo is all about so we have that energy of Virgo today and tomorrow to cut things out to cleanse to break away from things uh, to fire people if you need to, to clean. That's a great time to do some kind of cleaning, not only of your body as in cleanse or detox, but also your home, your office, your car, whatever needs a little bit of scrubbing. That would be a great thing. And then I thought about it. A lot of my friends, clients have now a lot of allergies, at least here in LA. I think that part of the reason is because of the blooming of a lot of the uh, fruit trees. As you know, we celebrated Tu Bishvat. Remember, Tu Bishvat was uh, the last full moon. A month ago and that represents the new year of the fruit trees and the reason why is because they observed in the old world the ancient world that around this time uh, end of january february most likely february the trees are starting the the nut trees the fruit trees are starting to bloom bloom i have a peach tree that's blooming i have a, a cherry tree that's blooming and i have a almond uh, tree not too far that is blooming so you can have a lot of these flowers now it's interesting that allergies are related to the immune system and this is all happening during the month of Pisces, which is that month between winter and spring, which is the month or the, the sign that rules the immune system and lymphatic system. So it's always kind of interesting how medical astrology fits into the uh, year in general. But at the same time, my orange tree is uh, giving us oranges right now and oranges are full of vitamin c that actually helps the immune system so you see that nature does not only say hey guys um i'm gonna have a lot of flowers right now so a lot of you are gonna be allergic but uh, hey don't worry because if you go down the street you see a, an orange tree you see the lemon trees you see some uh, grapefruit trees pick them up these are the medicine to the allergies that i inflicted on you uh, through the flowers of the other trees so Mother Nature is very, very, uh, let's say, accommodating and helpful. You know, she gives us the problem, but she also gives us the solution. So on uh, Sunday, we have this uh, full moon still going on. Monday, which is on uh, February 26, we have the sun right smack between 
Mercury and Saturn. First of all, Mercury in your chart or in charts in general doesn't go that far. Maybe maybe a sign away from one direction or the other direction. Most of us will have Mercury and the Sun in the same sign. So if you are a Scorpio, most likely your Mercury is in Scorpio, maybe a little bit Libra, maybe in Sagittarius, but it won't go that far away from the Sun, obviously because Mercury is the closest planet there is to the Sun. Even in Hebrew, it's called Kohav Chama, which basically means uh, the star of the Sun or the planet of the star. Yeah. Or the planet of the sun so it always lingers very close to the sun listening to the message saturn can go very very far from the sun obviously saturn is the planet that is the furthest away from the sun that you can actually see with the human eye so it's interesting that on monday tomorrow the day of the moon and also on tuesday we have something interesting the sun is right between the closest planet and the furthest planet away from it so we have uh, the closeness to the message and the ability to transmit that message to the further, furthest reaches of our solar system. Not the furthest, the furthest we can see with the human eye. So that's kind of an interesting situation. We have the combination of the zooming in, zooming out. There's some clarity. There is some insight that is happening to us. Because again, as above, so below, even you yourself will be able to look at something very close to you. You know, sometimes we can't see things too close because we're so close. We can't identify, you know, like when you zoom into an atom of the table, you can't really tell anymore if it's an atom of a table or an atom, atom of a chair or the atom of the mic. So sometimes we things get blurred when you get so close that's a th something that we all experience and also when something is really far away it's hard to identify precisely and what's happening in the next few days is in your personal life as well as up there in the celestial life we have that combination of the ability to really fast zoom in and zoom out and see things microscopically and see things in the uh, telescope as well so that ability to see the far away and close by and to translate between the two and glue them together is happening on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. I believe it's going to give you some kind of perspective. Now, at the same time, we have Chiron conjuncting, conjuncting the North Node, the North Node, the mean North Node. It's not the true North Node, but still it is a symbolic space uh, in the sky. It's basically where the sun and moon interact and, and cross each other's path. So Chiron on top of the North Node, we talked about it here before. We talked about the story of Chiron last Last week the wounded healer is helping you steer your karma because the north node is the ability to hold the steering wheel of karma instead of being influenced by it being able to steer it in the right direction so the navigation abilities of karma is very very high right now so again old wounds can come up in order for new ways of healing to show themselves up especially with mercury who was considered to be the god of medicine sitting on top of the sun giving us a lot of insights and with saturn there giving us the discipline and the ability to actually heal ourselves so that's part of what's happening around uh, monday tuesday wednesday again this whole week is kind of a mixture of a lot of planets but definitely that idea of the conjunction is the most important thing remember uh, on the weekend we had the conjunction of mars and venus now that conjunction is done but the cycle of mars and venus begun and now another cycle is be beginning of the Sun and Saturn that's going to last a year and of Chiron and the North Node, which is going to last 19 years. So th there's definitely a lot of new beginning happening in this full moon that we just experienced. So the next tomorrow, it's a good day for getting things done, especially around taxes, if you're thinking about it, because there is a moon in Virgo, which is all about accounting. A, a good clarity about your plans, immediate plans, the sun on top of Mercury, and also long-term plans, the sun on top of Saturn, and some kind of um, healing of maybe old wounds that are karmic-based and the ability to direct them in a new way or connect to new healers or new modalities to heal you. On Tuesday, the conjunction is getting very, very tight. Tight basically means that they're getting closer and closer. The planets are applying, it's called applying, basically are, uh, they're coming together to form this new planet. And what's happening on Tuesday and Wednesday, we don't have necessarily the regular conjunction of two planets coming together to form something new. We have three planets coming together. Three is always the three witches, the three fates, 
you know, and we'll also talk a little bit today about uh, the three-headed dog. Uh, I, I prepared it yesterday and I wondered, I wonder why am I doing this now? And I thought maybe because dogs are related to pets and pets are related to Virgo and there was a full moon in Virgo and today the moon is in Virgo. And then now I realize it's nothing to do with that. I probably somehow uh, tapped into the fact that we have a triple conjunction this week and that's why it's so important. So, what we have uh, uh, on uh, Tuesday is the beginning of that conjunction. Conjunction is declared as one degree separation. So when you have a planet seven degrees and then you have the sun eight degrees and then you have Saturn nine degrees, seven, eight, nine. Uh, that size sounds like an ATM code. So that's precisely what we have on Tuesday and Wednesday. They're in conjunction. Mercury, communication, marketing, sales, networking, building, bridging, putting people together. The sun that has to do with communication, marketing, uh, sorry, co co uh, the sun has to do with self-expression, your sense of self, your identity in many ways, creativity, your connection to your inner child, and Saturn, which is meant that, that represents discipline, persistence, endurance, father figures. So we're seeing uh, Saturn bring the element of time, patience, persistence, focus. It's like the mature adult. We have the son, which is kind of like uh, the father. The Saturn could be related to the grandfather. And then we have Mercury, who is the eternal youth. It represents the grandchild. You know, so we literally have this trinity of energy. And the reason why I'm saying more masculine is because the sun and Saturn are associated much more with masculine energy. Saturn sometimes, for some astrologer, represents the grandmother if the grandmother was very dominant. So you might have some issue with your grandmother, maybe grandfather, maybe both. So usually when Mercury on top of the sun, on top of Saturn come together, you have to communicate Mercury, you, the sun, with Saturn, with people who are older than you or have some power over you or have some authority over you. So look at what's happening Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. You might have a little bit of a understanding of who is your Saturn or who is the person that is the person that can teach you the most amount of discipline but also can cause a lot of pressure. So the key word for Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday is intellectual pressure, physical pressure, issues that you might have to come up uh, to deal with with time, um, discipline, persistent, focus. It's, it's very much about trying to connect as much as you can to your mission, to being very clear about what you want to achieve again in the next year because Saturn on top of, Sa of the sun lasts for a whole year. So that's part of also what is um, very important on Tuesday. So again, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, the most important weeks, uh, the days in this week and very important time because we also have the conjun conjunction of Chiron on top of uh, the North Node. And what's happening in Tuesday is that we also have the moon in Libra sitting on top of the South Node. And that represents a great ability to get rid of any kind of ancestral karma. The moon is all about your ancestors, about your DNA, about your epigenetics. And the South Node is karma and things that you want to get rid of, passed away. And because Chiron is sitting on top of the North Node, it provides you with new ways of dealing with ancestral karma or with your genetics. So even if you have an illness or sickness that might be coming from the DNA, from the family, there is a chance of Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, finding some kind of unique new ways of dealing with it. Or something new might come up that would be related to either ancestral karma or to issue that might be running down the generations that you'll be able to find a new fix. And the moon in Libra, in general, is great. It's called the moon of peace, the two of swords in the tarot card, for those of you doing the tarot card class. And by the way, you can still join. We just did two um, classes, and we have eight of them, and you'll get uh, the videos of those, and you can catch up pretty easily. We only did the major arcana. And uh, there is a link on my website, and there's a link on Instagram. It's every Wednesday. But anyway, the moon in Libra, the two of swords, is usually representing a spiritual decision you have to make. So on Tuesday, Wednesday, you might have to make some kind of decision that is spiritual in nature, that might be related to relationship, partnership, or even design, colors, art, or other ways of balancing yourself. 
because Chiron, eh, sorry, the North Node on top of uh, Chiron and the Moon on top of the South Node opposite to each other could actually mean new modalities of healing or new ways of looking at old wounds in relation to relationship or partnership. And because the Sun on top of Saturn is always karmic, meaning that it relates to past lifetime, the fact that we have the Moon, Mother, on top of the South Node, karma from the past, and at the same day, Sun, Father, on top of Saturn, the Lord Karma, there is a lot of connection in Tuesday and Wednesday to past lifetimes. You might do something that will remind you of a past life or you might be in a place that you actually been before. A lot of deja vus are going to happen on Tuesday. But in general, it's a good day for justice, fairness, law, art. On a Wednesday, you can see the perfect conjunction. The sun is 9 degrees Pisces, Mercury 9 degrees Pisces, Saturn 9 degrees Pisces. There is some 999 nine, nine going on. And 9 is an aviator in the clouds. Um, kind of interesting. The moon is in Libra, which is an air sign. And the Sabian symbol for 9 degrees Pisces is uh, some kind of uh, aviator, a, a, fi a, fi a pilot, a flyer uh, in the clouds. It doesn't have to be on the on the, um, a necessarily an airplane. Maybe it's a glider. Maybe it's somebody riding a dragon. But the... Overall, it looks like the ability to see things from above, maybe the ability to uh, have a God eye view of your life, which kind of supports the fact that all that Pisces energy talking about channeling and mystical energies. So definitely Tuesday and Wednesday specifically, Thursday are very mystical day, which have a coloring of very practical conjunction because of that Saturn energy. The moon is Tini Libra, the moon of justice, uh, which is great. And the moon is sending actually beautiful energy to Venus, to Mars, because the moon is in Libra and all these planets, Venus, Mars, Pluto, are in Aquarius. And remember, we talked about how we have 70% of the chart in Aquarius and Pisces, those two ages that we're moving back and forth from. We On Thursday, we have the conjunction still pretty strong, Saturn, uh, but, but the Sun and, the, and Mercury are basically drifting away or fading their uh, influence over Saturn, so it's going to get a little bit less heavy on Thursday. So Tuesday, Wednesday, you might see the mountain you have to climb up or you might feel the burden of extra workload or extra workload, extra uh, energy, the ability to remain calm is tested on Tuesday and Wednesday. Thursday, things are starting to elevate a little bit, even though the moon is going to be in Scorpio, but the moon in Scorpio is sending an amazing energy to all of these planets in Pisces. So what we have with the moon in Scorpio, the moon in Scorpio, remember, is fallen because it's opposite to the moon in Taurus, which is exalted. But the moon in Scorpio is very magical. It's very good for research, for working with other people's money, other people's talents, investments. All of those energies are really opening up very, very well, very strongly at that time. And the moon sending beautiful energy to Saturn, to Mars, sorry, to Saturn, to the sun, to Mercury is great. I mean, Thursday, you might feel satisfaction. You might feel like things are going your way, even though the moon is fallen. The moon in fallen in, in Scorpio sometimes means like, no, I don't think I can do it. I, I don't know if I'm going to make it on time. Well, I don't think I can get that thing ready by because there is that energy of instinct to say no, not no because you're being mean, but no because you're not confident enough that you can get it done. So again, Moon in Taurus is exalted and it's full of self-worth. Moon in Scorpio tends to be insecure about a lot of things. That being said, it's the wizard, it's the witch. So there's a lot of movement between the Moon and Mercury, logic and, let's say, passion, reason and emotions, thoughts and and um, intuition. So there's something linking together the written word with your emotion. And remember we said memories that carry feelings always are remembered longer. So that's going to be very, very strong around uh, Thursday. So Thursday is an interesting day. It has a beautiful trine. And again, a lot of the planets are sending beautiful energy to each other. Even the south and the north node are sending beautiful energy to Mer Mars and, um, and uh, Venus. That's a really good thing. The only thing is that we're having um, a little bit of a square forming between Venus and Uranus. That's going to be tighter next week. And that means uh, meetings with the crazy people, uh, a relationship going unpredictably, gadgets and computers breaking out like the Pauli effect, you know, that uh, wherever you pass, machines start um, burning. So that's going to be more next week. But we're going to start feeling it on the weekend, I think. And that, that square can be a little bit uncomfortable um, coming, let's say, 
from Sunday onward. Then uh, we have the moon continuing to be in Scorpio in um, Friday on May 1st, March 1st, sorry. And we have the lip thingy going on on uh, Thursday. So it's kind of interesting that Thursday is um, a missing day. Usually it doesn't exist that the February 29th. Remember, it's a leap year this year. So the fact that we actually have that hidden day, it's a little bit of magic going on that day, especially because, again, the conjunction was just a day before. But on March 1st, what we see is, um, again, Friday, we see that the sun is again between Saturn and Mercury, but this time Mercury is on the other side. Uh, we see the conjunction that the square between Venus and Uranus are getting tighter and tighter. You see that Venus is 17 degrees Aquarius, Uranus is 19 degrees, so it's only two degrees separation. So definitely Saturday, Sunday, and next week are going to be guided by that. That being said, still, even though we have a, on Friday the moon that is fallen, she's sending actually good energy to the sun. The only problem with Friday, especially for dating or for any kind of uh, if, you know one-on-one -on -one interaction, it's a little bit uh, problematic with the moon squaring Venus. Especially for women, with, with women, it can be a little bit more difficult because of that square between uh, the moon and Mars. Between Actually, you know what? It's men and women because Venus and Mars are very close to each other. The moon is going to be squaring both of them. That's going to be a little bit more difficult, um, that, that square between the moon and Venus, the moon and Mars. Not the best for relationships. So if you want to date, maybe it's better to do it uh, Saturday, Sunday, uh, Friday, even though it's the day of Venus, is not the easiest for that. Besides that, uh, we have, um, let's see, on Saturday, we have the moon moving between Aquarius, sorry, Pi, uh, Scorpio to Sagittarius. When it's going to move into Sagittarius, she's going to get a better connection to Venus and Mars, which is great, but she's going to get a square into Saturn, Sun, Mercury, and Neptune, so you can't really escape. But uh, Saturday, the moon in Scorpio, again, a very magical uh, moon. It's going to be moving into Sagittarius towards the, let's say, end of Saturday, beginning of Sunday. And it's always going to be easier for us to have the moon in Sagittarius than to have it in Scorpio. And as you can see, the square is really form forming between Venus and Uranus on Saturday. So Sunday, Saturday, Sunday, sun, uh, su Saturday, Sunday, Monday will be that square. So again, it could be a little bit more tight and difficult on relationship, not only because the trigger of it was Friday with the moon squaring Venus, then uh, the Venus squaring Uranus, it's going to create a lot of squares, especially with the moon being opposite to Uranus. That's going to be a little bit tough. So again, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, a little bit tougher in relationship. There is a lot of instinct for new wisdom or connection to wise teacher, wise women happening on Sunday specifically because the moon is going to be on Minerva, the goddess of wisdom. And uh, the moon is going to send beautiful energy to Mars and Venus. So next Sunday is a day for adventures and doing things. But again, be careful in relationship. You see the formation of that uh, square between Venus and Uranus is so tight on March 3rd and March 4th. So Sunday, Monday, next week a little bit tougher in relationships. What I wanted to share is just some thoughts about doggies. Um, again, if you are interested in the cycles, uh, not that you need to plan your life because your life is sometimes planned anyway, but I think that what this uh, workshop is, because I've started doing it on and off, and I uh, realized that there is something needed to work on uh, the cycles on astrology and to figure out how to plan your life, knowing next week or next year you're getting into a seven year. It's important to know what you want from that seven. What is the square of Saturn trying to get to you uh, or to teach you? Or if you're going through a solar return, what does it mean? Why is your birthday so difficult? Or if it's a Saturn return or it's a Saturn return to your puberty, which is the age of 40, 41. It does, it's, it's almost like knowing the season, but knowing the season in your life in your life form so that's what we're going to do on uh, march 20th 1 p.m in los angeles time so pets pets are ruled by virgo we talked about it many times that's why we have service dogs remember uh, virgo is the sign of work it's the sign of service and most of our pets 
worked in the past. They were not just like sitting there by the fireplace. Uh, cats took care of the rats and the mice in the grain. When we started collecting grain, when we started domesticating plants, we had a surplus that needed to be put in jars and uh, traded or kept safe. And the mice were, of course, eating it quite a lot. So the cats did that job and also uh, they take care of energy. And as I'm talking about the cats, uh, Banga, he always answers. So um, they are very practical. That's why Banga is here to take care of any kind of rats or invasions. And dogs, of course, <laughs> they helped in hunting. They protect. Uh, they serve. You know, if you have a border coolie or if you have a German shepherd, they're all working dogs. And their origin is all about working. So pets definitely have to do a lot with the energy of Virgo which is about service, it's about work. And funny enough, we also know that pets help with our health. Uh, petting pa pets uh, reduces heart rate, it uh, reduces anxiety. They've proven it to so many different uh, afflictions. And the way I divide pets, at least cats and dogs, is cats are there to teach us how to give love because they don't necessarily uh, give it back. So we learn how to be unconditional in our giving of love. And dogs teach us how to receive love unconditionally. So the dogs teach us how to be unconditional so we can give that unconditional love to the cats. You know, that's why dogs don't like cats because they do all the hard work and they don't get as much. And Cerebrus is a very famous dog. It's the three-headed dog that guarded the gates of hell, the gates of Hades. And it was supposed to protect the souls that were there, but also protect uh, us from leaks of souls that were already dead to come back. For me, it's a metaphor of, you know what, you died as whoever you were in a past lifetime. We don't need your past ego to take over your current ego. That's why your, your past ego <clears throat> should be in the in Sheol, it should be in a memory, it should be someplace else, you know, uh, maybe uh, classified and uh, registered in some kind of cosmic server, you know. So the idea is that the three-headed dog is supposed to protect us, you know, if you think about the spiritual element of it, from our past lifetimes. And the reason why it has three heads is because one head is supposed to protect from the past, another head from the present, the last head from the future. So it's not only attacks that might come to us right now, that's only one head of the three, it could be attacks that came from the past or attacks that are coming from the future. So it's almost as if um, you can have here an army that protects us not only from invasions that might be coming now, but maybe from future uh, people who time travel into this time, so in, sub, in, in some time machines, so to protect us against them as well. So the idea is that Cerebrus, which we don't really know what the, the name means, it might be coming from Sanskrit, some people believe it might be coming from different uh, uh, sources, there's no clarity about it, but he was definitely the pet of the world, the, the Pluto or Hades, the lord of the underworld, and he had three heads, in some stories he had 50 heads, sometimes he has uh, tails of uh, a serpent, that's because he's the son of Typhon, and Typhon had many, many heads, if you remember, that's the, the serpent, so uh, Hydra is his, um, his sister. You know, so he comes from a very important pedigree in a way. The only one that could overcome it is uh, Hercules, who did it by force, and Orpheus, who did it through music, which is kind of interesting. So the only way to overcome it is through either music and sound or through uh, basically pure force. And that was the 12th or the last uh, assignment, by the way, of Hercules' tasks to overcome Cerebrus. It wasn't to kill him, it was just to bring him uh, to a king. It was one of the impossible tasks of Hercules. But the interesting thing about it is that I thought about, again, we had just Virgo uh, in our uh, uh, yesterday, uh, the full moon, and I was teaching that, that tarot class on, uh, sorry, the tarot card in the class of the tarot on Wednesday. And I was thinking about how beautiful this card is. This is from the Toth deck. You see the wheat that represents uh, Virgo. You see him holding the light. He's the hermit. He's the one that came up the, build, the, the mountain first. And he's holding the light for the people to follow his path. There is the letter Yod in Hebrew, which represents Virgo in Kabbalah. Yod is the hand. That's why it's shaped like that. It's the smallest letter, the most humble letter that builds all the rest of the letters. And it also represents 
the sperm of God. That's why the letter itself is supposed to look like a sperm, and it represents a, the ability, the hand of God in a sense that God gave Virgo the rule over his sperm in a sense. You're not going to give it to Scorpio or to Aries who are horny signs and will immediately spend that sperm on somebody. You give it to the hermit or to the nun or to the uh, tantric uh, meditator who is not supposed to ejaculate and take that sperm out. Uh, to uh, you know, It's the same way that you don't let the cat uh, guard the milk, you don't let Scorpio guard the sperm, but you do let it to Virgo. And you see here the three-headed dog that represents the entrance into the underworld. The idea that it is through Virgo that we go down. What does that mean? Through diet and detox and rehabilitation and um, uh, making sure that we're cutting away from any kind of substances that we can get into the underworld, into the deep meditation and figure out who we are. This is the three-headed dog depicted uh, by William Blake because it was supposed to be, I think, in the third ring of uh, um, uh, Dante's Hells. And uh, his father was, of course, uh, the um, snake-footed Typhon, <clears throat> and he was the brother of the, a lot of multi-headed um, monsters. So Hydra, um, Orthrus, and also it, it represents basically the ability to guard the underworld and the underworld in psychological terms represents our shadow or our subconscious or our unconscious. And of course, if you look at the Norse tradition, you also have the idea of uh, Fenrir in, Randarok, in uh, Rangarok, that is the fate, basically it means the fate of the gods. At the end of time, he's a child of Loki, it's a big, big wolf that is supposed to devour Odin, and then he will be killed by Odin's son, who is supposed to survive uh, Ragnarok. And Ragnarok, of course, is the apocalypse, according to the Norse tradition. And so the dog, the wolf, is a lot of time associated, the hounds of hell, with the underworld. So uh, the reason why I thought about it for a while, and then I realized that the answer is most likely after I lost my dog, Balkan, is that dogs don't last as long as humans, obviously, 10 to 15 years. So if you're a dog lover, you could have three, four, five dogs even in your lifetime. And five times you have to deal with the journey to the underworld, not through your parent or through uh, somebody around you who dies, because humans don't die as fast. They last longer. But dogs that you create that really strong bond, your best friend in a sense, can die on you much faster. And that's why dogs and cats teach us about death and dying. And I think that that's one of the reasons they're associated with uh, the underworld, the end of time, death, and letting go. So I hope you have an amazing week, um, like um, a week full of joy and a lot of conjunction that are going to be pretty significant. I think also in world events, just look Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. The news are going to be bombarded with uh, revelations or old things that are coming up some issues in relationships and partnerships. So um, I'm saying goodbye to everybody. I hope to see you in uh, the classes. And thanks a lot and have a great, great week.